Hello, everyone. Welcome back to King Poe Myers. And we are finishing up King Month this month. We've had a lot of great guests. We've had a lot of great King Talk. And we wrap up the month with our old friend. We had him on not too long ago, Mr. Josh Bates. Josh, how are you? Doing great. Thanks for having me again, guys. Really appreciate coming back on a second time. We're very excited to have you back because um, our last time we talked, we talked about a lot of stuff, but we ended it really talking about King, Dark Tower, all that good stuff. But now we, I really want to have you back on because I wanted to go more in depth with you on King. So, I mean, sorry, I have to throw you um, a curveball just to begin. <laughs> Where would you rank King amongst most influential authors for you? For me, he's number one. I see King in... I'm a writer. If you haven't, if you haven't listened to our previous um, podcast, go and check it out. But I'm a, I'm a horror writer myself. So when I uh, when I when I study my own work, I, I see Stephen King written throughout the page. So he's definitely the number one influence for me. Um, I grew up starting with um, Darren Shan, who's kind of a young adult horror writer, and then I tried some Poe, um, and I love Edgar Allan Poe. Um, I also am a big fan. Um, I'm also a big fan of Ray Bradbury. He's definitely more sci-fi based. I would I would categorize him as than horror. Um, but when it comes to King, he's he's number one on the on the Mount Rushmore of influential writers in my life. Um, I kind of proud myself on having read just about everything by King. There's still one or two books that I haven't read by him, but um, I've read mostly everything by King. So yeah, he's definitely number one um, for influencers. Completely agree. Once again, for me, it's really him versus Poe. Very different styles, obviously, very different times, but exactly. two outstanding authors. Um, before we jump into King, though, I love your nod to Mr. Ray Bradbury because I really haven't read much of his stuff. I read Halloween Tree this past year. And I'm like, oh, this is like for like m middle school, maybe late elementary school. And I'm looking at more of his stuff and it's like, he did children, he did young adult, he did adult. That man is insane. So I'm really excited to get more into Ray Bradbury as well. Yeah, he had a wide array of works. I, I kind of went through a little Bradbury kick one summer um, after reading King's Joyland, um, which we'll probably talk about here coming up. But I, I had that, that sentimentality of Joyland and I wanted to continue it. Um, so I remember picking up Bradbury's um, somewhere, somewhere this way, somewhere this wicked comes. I know I'm butchering that title right now. Um, some way. Oh, which one you're talking about? I always screw it up too. <laughs> um, but yeah, that that that's a great Bradbury story. Um, and of course, the famous one that you probably read in high school is "The Sound of Thunder," which is the the short story about the uh, the safari guide going back in time to hunt the T Rex, um, and that and that gave birth, of course, to the butterfly effect, um, the butterfly effect, and and time travel and the paradox that it, um, that of course it issues out. So yeah, Ray Bradbury is such an influential author um, for modern times as well. Well, once again, I cannot wait to jump more into him, but we're here for King. Um, do you remember your last King book that you read? Yes, so you and I were just talking before we got on. I'm right now on the waiting list for later, just because the funds aren't there to outright buy it. But yes, I'm looking forward to the newest King novel. Um, so if you're listening right now, hope maybe you've read it and maybe you have some, some awesome opinions on it. My last book, my last King book that I read wasn't too long ago. Let's see, I read Revival. I read Salem's Lot. I don't think there, I think Salem's Lot actually, now that I'm thinking about it, was the last King book that I read. I wanted to give it a reread because actually um, I had read Salem's Lot, which of course is King's take um, on the vampire tale, right? King famously said he always wondered what would happen if we if we transported um, Dracula to America, right? How would how would he interact in small town sleepy America, right? He'd fit right in. Um, so I just wanted to reread Salem's Lot because I hadn't read that since high school. And I remember as a high schooler, I didn't like it. And we, we're both old teachers. We know that as, as kids, we really don't know much. So I wanted to re-experience that story now that I'm an adult. Um, and I loved it. Salem's Lot's an awesome vampire tale. Um, not a huge fan of the ending. I think it kind of peters out. Uh, I think it has a great buildup. Mm -hmm. um, and then once, once we get to the Father Callahan kind of funeral scene, I think the book 
kind of just is ready to be done. And you can kind of sense that, but I think it's a great story. I love Father Callahan. He, He's got such a great arc. Great arc. I mean, I haven't finished Dark Tower, obviously, so he shows up there. But just in that one yes, book, I mean, he was very tragic. He was also a badass. But at the end, like, when I first read it, I thought he got bitten. But then, like, I reread it. I'm like, wait, no. Yeah, he just slinks away into the he night. gets out of Dodge. Yeah. Yeah, and without the Dark Tower series, it'd be interesting to see how we would read that character. Because I obviously read the Dark Tower. I've consumed it many times. Mm -hmm. And so I have this, you know, further knowledge of this character. So it's interesting that I'll never uh, truly get a sense of who Father Callahan was before the Dark Tower came out since I'm so young, since I didn't get to experience him. Mm -hmm. You know, if you had read Stephen King as he was publishing his works as a, as a now. So mm -hmm. yeah, he's an interesting character. It's hard to, I wish I could separate what happens to him from that story because honestly the Father Callahan in the story, I'm not a huge fan of, but I'm a huge Father Callahan fan, you know? So it's, it's interesting. Were you happy that King brought him? back or do you wish he kind of stayed no, with I'm that very happy. his story i think like i just said would be very nihilistic uh if he didn't bring him back right that he just says all right i give up i'm gonna go with the liquor uh mr Leahy," and he <laughs> doesn't right he brings it back full circle so i think i think um i think if there's a character king wanted to bring back and we have seen him done do this now with the mercedes trilogy and with uh with what's her mm -hmm. face Right, he likes bringing back characters. So I think there, if there's a character to bring back, um, he picked the right one in Father Callahan, in my opinion. Do you think that um, Barlow was able to, or can, hold um, hold his own against Dracula, or do you think it's not, not, no one can really touch Bram Stoker's Dracula? That's so interesting. I've never thought of that question. Ah, two vampires slated against one another. I'm not sure. What what's your stance on it? Have you <sighs> Do you are are you a gamer by any chance? Huge gamer. Oh yeah. Because for our audience now, I've actually never read Dracula. I have watched almost every single movie adaptation from Christopher Lee to the classic um Universal, but I've actually never read it. Um I'm planning to read it this Halloween. I'm making a very big deal out of it. But sure. my favorite Dracula is from the Castlevania series. Mm -hmm. I think they give him such an amazing backstory. And it's he's really a tragic character, but he's also a complete badass. Right. From some of the movies, I mean, growing up now, I'm like, oh, he kind of doesn't really do much. Yeah. I, and as a gamer, I, I love the Castlevania version because I spent – you can play the video games. I don't know if you watch the anime, but it's absolutely outstanding. And he's just this very complex character. Mm -hmm. So that's the Dracula that I always know. I don't usually go to Bram Stoker's Dracula, but. And that's interesting that you point that out because as a child growing up, I was never huge into Dracula um, myself. And I wonder if it's for those reasons that you kind of pointed out um, that, is that he's kind of this one-sided character. So yeah, that's interesting. I've never thought about it. Um, yeah. Did you ever see the movie adaptation, the original you of Sam? You know what? I haven't seen it all the way through. I've seen the one with Gary Oldman, right? That's um the 1990s Dracula, right? That's the one I'm thinking of, yeah. And I've seen bits and clips of that, and it just, I don't know, it never held my attention. The whole vampire thing, even though it's very ironic, vampires is kind of what got me into the horror genre. But the whole vampire trope never truly fascinated me that much. Like, I've never really? read Twilight, um, which I know is a big culture phenomenon. I, I don't know. Vampires, I think it's just been overdone so much that it's never been a huge interest of mine. Wait, have you read or watched Interview with a Vampire? Anne have Rice's? Not. No, oh. have not. Oh, you. That's a classic, though, right? It's That's an absolute classic. And while um, the movie does take certain liberties, fans and even Anne Rice say, I'm happy they took those liberties and they made those changes. You can just watch the movie and you can really 
get a firm grasp of her world and her characters because those for me are vampires like i choose her vampires over over dracula over um barlow i mean it's lestat and for those who have watched the movie he's played by uh tom cruise okay and he just he just such a perfect character he is my all-time favorite vampire i really suggest you either watch or read it's so yeah i definitely will i've actually had that suggestion before not too long ago so it's it's kind of eerie that you bring that up it's life telling me get on it absolutely (laughs) um moving right along you did salem's Lot, but then you brought up revival i just read that um last year what did you think of it I, I'm a sucker for first person stories, kind of those frame stories, right? Where we're getting almost a diary entry. I really enjoy that kind of writing. And I think King, um, King really excels at that type of style of writing. So whenever there's a first person narrative, um, that kind of journeys throughout the life, think it, I'm, I'm always on board, right? I'm always right there. I, I thought revival was absolutely fascinating. And I've talked to a lot of King fans who have said, yeah, that's, I haven't read that one because it's more recent. Um, so if you're somebody who who's looking to get back into King, um, maybe doesn't want the over gore fest that some of King's works can showcase, but you're still looking for a creepy King read. I love the revival for that. Um, who I'm trying to remember. It's been about six months. Our narrator, what's his name again? Is it Jacob? No, that's the Jacob is the, yeah, Jacob is the villain. I, I can't remember the narrative. I, I want to say it might be Jeffrey now that I'm thinking about it. Um, but anyway, I just love his, his kind of story arc, how he and how he and the minister, Charles, um, are kind of like welded together throughout yeah. life. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I thought that was a beautiful story. I mean, for me, I thought Revival was good. I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. Um, a lot of people I talked to for Revival was, it's all about the ending. It's all about this crazy ending that King creates. Um, I well, was- that ending is actually based upon um, Robert Browning's poem, Child Rolling to the Dark Tower Came. That ending of King's in Revival is based upon research done on Browning's work. Um, oh. Because Browning and his work had uh, these kind of like these mutant people, these mutant like slave people um, that kind of made up the tower. And so that the ending also kind of feeds into the whole Dark Tower lore because it almost builds upon not only King's mythos and what he's created, but kind of where these original myths stem from, which of course is Browning's poem. Um, I'm not doing it justice. There's a lot of research to it. In college, I I wrote a whole thesis on it, so I'm not doing it justice. But um, yeah, that ending of Revival, which is probably why I like it so much, it's not just kind of like King is doing this out of nowhere. Like there's roots and a why to why these like mutant mud men um, are slaving away behind behind the veil. Um, I really liked it. Was it, I, I did not write a thesis on this. I think I read it online. So of course it must be true. Was it also a nod to Lovecraft at all? Yeah, yeah, definitely Lovecraftian as well. Um, which again is another huge King in influence, right? Most of his work is Lovecraftian based in one form or another. So, right, if you think about like the raft, right? That short story. Love the raft. Of, like right, his most famous, not one, his most famous short stories. That's right out of a Lovecraft story, right? Tentacles reaching out of the out of the the abyss. That that's Lovecraft for you. Lovecraft did like his tentacles. <laughs> and I can't think of the name of uh, the short story, but King also did like a love an ode to Lovecraft. It, it took place in Britain. I think Cthulhu makes a, an appearance at the very end. Right. I think that was in Nightmares and Dreamscapes. Yes. Yeah, you're right. I don't remember the title of that one either, but yeah. Yeah, his, his work is stamped all over King. So we talked about two stories that, that you read recently that you like fairly well, if yeah, not love. I would reread them, certainly. When for you did Stephen King just lay an egg? You were excited. You got the book, and it was just like, "What? What are you doing to me, Mr. King? What are you doing?" <laughs> There's a couple like that. Like, if you think back 
to Cujo. Cujo might be one of those that you could point really? to. Really? Well, I mean, in his interviews, he's talked about how he's blackout drunk writing Cujo, mm-hmm. and it's not the best paced novel. It's a fine novel, and it's been blown up because of the movie, certainly. Um, but I don't think it's the best novel. Uh, the In recent memory, one that really irked me was Sleeping Beauties that he co-wrote with Owen King, one of his sons. Um, Cause it was just obvious that his son Owen King wrote it, who he's not his father and he's not even his brother. Um, you maybe work greeting cards, right? I don't know. Um, maybe Damn, maybe. man. Um, but it was, <laughs> I'm, all jokes aside, all jokes aside, it's clear that King just kind of stamped his name on the book to, to help his son. Um, and really? if you pick up, the, it's a tomb, right? That thing is it, it length. Um, it's just kind of slapping the face to fans, in my opinion. Um, I don't know. I've read other reviews. I remember re- reading a New York Times review that kind of really chaffed at King as well because it just didn't feel like he cared. Um, so that's certainly one in recent memory where I said, come on, what's this? Um, ah, another unpopular opinion. I'm not a big fan of the Mercedes trilogy. I just don't like the crime. I don't know. I'm not a big crime um, fan, which... King has really been into lately bringing back Holly Gibbons, right? Yeah, Holly. Yes. Um, she's been in multiple stories the past decade, right? The Outsider. She's in the trilogy, of course. She has her own story in the in the latest um, If It Bleeds. Yep. Um, so King's really been into been into that crime trope, and that's fine. Uh, I, I appreciate when authors can evolve and write kind of what we were saying with Bradbury, how they can um, pick different fruit from different trees. I appreciate that but I'm also not going to like every fruit that's given to me. Um, and that's just kind of the case with, um, with the trilogy there. So I'm not a big Mercedes trilogy fan. I read the first two. I made it halfway through the third. I, I guess it's just the characters. I could never relate to uh, the detective. What was his name? Ralph? I think his name was. No, I don't know. The detective, not a huge fan of. I was a huge fan of Holly. I think she is one of the more strong characters in the King universe, because if we... Uh, want to be as objective as we can. Sure, we're kissing the boot heels of King, right? He's our master. But at the same time, he's not the best at writing strong female characters. A lot of times they're very over-sexualized, um, kind of stereotypical. And I know we can look at a, kind of a lot of his work is his best work is grounded in the 80s. And maybe that's not the best culture um, for work to stem from because everyone has hopped up on their minds and drugs. Um, but still, we got we to gotta acknowledge that his female characters maybe aren't the best representation of, of women. Um, but with that being said, I think Holly is a fine, um, is a fine character. I don't know. I'm going on this long tangent. I don't remember what the I love it. <laughs> um, well, I asked you originally, um, you know, what for you laid an egg and you brought up Cujo. Um, and Cujo is a fine novel. I just won't ever reread it again. To me, my sense is, Kind of my my line my radar is if you're not going to reread it again it may have given you something but it didn't give you what you need to live right it, it mm-hmm. may be a fine piece of chocolate but it's not a steak right you, you i don't know you need something more so i don't know Cujo's fine and there's a number of king books unfortunately that i think are fine but i'm not sure i would ever revisit like dream catcher i think is a fine work but i'm not mm-hmm. sure i ever revisit it Trying to think of others. Um, have you ever read Dolores Claiborne? Not yet. That's one that I really love the idea of telling a story in second person, but I'm afraid that telling a second person styled story over the course of 500 pages is a bit daunting. Mm-hmm. I, I can only make it about 250, I remember. I made it about halfway through. And then I just, I, I took a weekend off for reading. And then picking up second person it's impossible to pick that up. That's like picking up the heart of darkness after not reading it for a month. You're not going to go anywhere. Uh, so I don't know. I think it's interesting. King is so fascinating. And I love, yes. uh, I love that he does take creative leaps because as a writer, that's what you have to do. Will every single one work? No, but there's still some that will. Like when he inserts himself in the Dark Tower series, I think that is the coolest thing that I've ever seen a writer do. I have never seen a writer go so meta that they say, this is my story so much that I need to put myself in the story in order for me to 
fully be able to tell you it. I think that is incredible. And I, I don't know, maybe there's another example of an author doing that, but I'd like to, I'd like to hear it because I've never heard of an author doing that before. I finished uh, Wolves of Kala last month. So you haven't made it to number six, so I might I, have just dropped a big spoiler on No, you. no, 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 you, you didn't actually, because that's actually how five ends. Is that how five ends, Oka? I think um, someone is like reading Salem's Lot and Father Callahan's like, I'm not a character. And I'm like, what mm -hmm. the hell? And, and it gets then, a big meta spin in book six and seven. And then it's like, who's this Stephen King guy? And my mind just kind of was like, wait, it's one of those things where I, I was like shaking my head and I was like rereading. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, what's what? going on here? What are you, wait, they're, they're going to Stephen King's house, but so nothing has been spoiled for me really. So I have no idea what's coming my way. Yeah, you really don't. Cause he wrote those last three books after his accident. So he must've been just like, I gotta do crazy shit because who knows I could die at any minute. Um, and he went for it. I appreciate that. Um, you brought up uh, Mr. Mercedes trilogy. I get it if you don't like, you know, um, crime novels or crime in general. They won't be for you. I am madly in love with the first two books, especially the second one. I think for some reason, um, it just kind of had that old school, old school like noir feel to it. Yeah, out of all three, I would say the second I I did it like the most. And the third one, I really, I'm a little disappointed. He's going supernatural with it, mm -hmm. but I understand. Yeah, but it makes sense. I those were my first two reads of this year, and I went right to the third one. It started getting supernatural. I'm like, this isn't bad, but I kind of need a break from these characters and this world. And so I'm gonna go back to three in a few months. Exactly, exactly what happened to me. I had that same thought. I just I don't know. The characters don't do it for me. They're fine characters, and they're fleshed out. I mean, King isn't a, does a superb job at fleshing out his characters. You know everything about them. And I appreciate that. I just don't like this set of characters and their and their world that they've cultivated. I just don't like it. It's not for me. I got you. I have not read Sleeping Beauties. Um, it's weird. it's where they brought up his son because forever I only thought he only had one author son, Joe Hill. And Joe when Hill. you brought up Owen, I was like, wait, they're not the same. Like I honestly, for some reason, thought that it was Joe Hill before he took on the uh, the pen yeah, name. Yeah, that's his real name. No, that's no. He'd probably be offended. I would be if I were Joe Hill. If you saw, <laughs> just <kidding. laughs> no, he yeah, his, he has two sons. One named Owen. I guess he's more of a poet. And I I okay. I'm fair. I haven't read anything else of Owen. Um, I haven't read his poetry. Perhaps he's a beautiful poet. Um, he just maybe shouldn't write novels. <laughs> Damn! I don't Josh. think I'm a King fan. Um, that feels that way, but maybe. Um, quick little side tangent because I've been talking to um a lot of people during King Month about Joe Hill because mm -hmm. he has quite a library, and you know he's right next to his dad at Barnes and Noble, and you know Audible is always recommending me his stuff. Have you read anything by Joe Hill? I read all of Joe Hill, actually. Jesus, um, all right. Yeah, I'm, I'm a Joe Hill fan. I want to say that right away, that I'm a Joe Hill fan. I used to be an English teacher. I have taught Joe Hill as part of my curriculum. Awesome. I taught Stephen King, of course. Um, but I have taught Joe Hill as well. So I think um, Joe Hill is a fine author. I think he excels at short stories. If you look at his first short story collection, 20th Century Ghosts, mm -hmm. those are some of the most creative story ideas I have ever I have ever read. There's this one story called um, I can't remember its title and it's gonna kill me. But it's about a, a child whose best friend is in a, a inflatable doll, and the inflatable doll isn't like this child's not like seeing things. The inflatable doll actually is a person that writes down notes, and it's this tragic story about how society it's. It's very satirical, right? It's, it's satire of our society and how we push this unknown object, this unknown person out of our society just because it's different from us. It's such a unique spin. It was so creative. But yeah, Joe Hill's very creative. 
My one thing is I don't think he's great at writing novels. I just don't love, and I, I struggle to put my finger on it. 20th century, or um, his first one was Heart Shaped Box, which was a ghost story. I never could root for the narrator who was kind of like the heavy metal rock guy. Um, I could never just root for him. He didn't seem like he was a very good guy. Um, he, he was chauvinistic. He was kind of a pig. Um, mm -hmm. I, do, I could just never get on his side. And I thought that Joe Hill never gave him enough redeemable qualities to make me want um, to root for somebody like that. Because if you're going to have a narrator who has kind of a dark side, you got to give them some kind of redeemable quality um, or else oh, great. You, you turn your reader off, which is my opinion and my, yeah. So um, I thought that was a fine novel. I think Horns is a terrific Joe Hill novel. Um, such a cool idea that, right, if you haven't read Horns, um, and, and there's a movie played by Harry Potter, Daniel Radcliffe, and the basic premise is that Daniel Radcliffe, Harry Potter, wakes up with devil horns. And now when he talks to people, they share their most innermost secrets with him, um, which is a really unique and cool story idea. And you get a lot of um, you get a lot of behind the scenes of human nature of what we as humans are really thinking. And again, I think for me, I love that shit. I love digging into human nature. Um, so I think those first two novels are fine. Um, I'm trying to think his latest one, though, kind of left me disappointed. His latest one, yeah, his latest one was a book of short stories called Full Throttle. And other than there was one, um, there's this one sci-fi kind of short story in there that was just unrelentingly tragic. And by the end, oh, it's so metaphorical. Um, but other than the one short story in that collection, none of them really blew me away. So I think Joe Hill is a great author. A good author, not a great author. I think he's a good author who has yet to, um, who has yet to kind of release that book that makes you say, "Oh, that's Joe Hill." Oh, The Shining, Stephen King. Oh, it, Stephen King. Right? I, I don't think he's had that that breakthrough book yet that makes us say, "Oh, that's Joe Hill." I got the Nosferatu is another one. Um, the Fireman is another one. I've read both of those fine novels. Um, I just don't think they push. The bounds of anything revolutionary which is fine i'm not saying i'm a writer i'm not saying that's what i'm doing i wish i could um i'm just saying he hasn't broken through um on that plateau that the shining takes on the plateau that the stand has um but maybe not every author does yeah yeah thinking about that maybe that's just not who he'll ever be and that's okay i mean the fact that you can talk so passionately about some of his works and to say you know he's a good author i i would if i was an author I'd, like, I would kill for that like someone likes yeah. me that much like you don't have to call me you know the best of my generation but to like my work that much i think that's a great compliment for any author and i think it's just my preference thinking yeah. about it, what doesn't grab me is what his father does is what somebody like tim o'brien who's not a horror writer but he's an amazing writer is that these authors, they try to examine human nature. And I think Joe, Joe Hill does that at a story level, but I almost want the insightful analysis that King sometimes in, inserts, that Tim O'Brien always inserts. I want the, those one or two lines that tell us, this is what life really is. And I feel like Joe Hill, he gives us situations that show us that, but he doesn't like, he brings us to the graveyard, but he doesn't dig underneath the ground. And I, I want to see the bones. I know I'm there, but I also want to see the skeletal head. And then that's kind of where I'm at with, with Joe Hill. And maybe that's something that he has to grow into, or maybe that's just not who he is as an author. And I need to stop looking for that because he's not his dad. He's not Tim O'Brien. That's a hell of a metaphor. Bring, brings you to the graveyard doesn't dig for the bones i like that a lot i'm gonna use that in Thank life. You. yeah that's really good <laughs> i appreciate that for me for our listeners who have not read anything by joe hill if there's one book that we have to start with that's the one i brought out right away 20th century ghosts is a book of short stories um everyone is so unique there's one about a family that goes to a museum but it's a museum of last breaths. So you can see the last hmm. breath of this famous king. You can see, and they're in these little vials. And then of course it turns into, well, we're gonna get somebody's last breath in this short story. And that's exactly what we get. So that one is such a good short story. Um, there's a dozen others. If you're looking for a Joe Hill 
I would highly recommend 20th Century Ghosts. It's the first book that he ever published. He published it under Joe Hill again because he wanted to break out as his own and not as his uh, and not as his dad's son. Um, and that's the book that you can see he was looking to break through. Whereas the mm -hmm. others, I think, are fine stories, but I don't think that intensity, that grit, I don't think um, it's there quite as much as it is in, in that first in that first collection of his. And then Horns. If you're looking for a novel, Horns was his second book called Earth. His second novel, his first novel was Heart Shaped Box, which is a fine ghost story. Um, but I think Horns, his second book, um, I think that's a better novel if you're looking for a novel. Thank you for that. Now, I mean, I'm currently reading a collection of short stories by Richard Chismar on The Long Way Home, and I'm yeah. madly in love with it. So I'm kind of going through a short story kick while going through yeah. Dark Tower. So I'll definitely Makes have to sense. check that out. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a really good one. Um, no spoilers, please. But I, someone, I'm sorry, I cannot remember who, someone mentioned about Joe Hill that a criticism of theirs, of him, is he tried to, I don't know if it was use his dad's characters, but made maybe similar characters that were like, it was very obvious. Do you agree with that or... I'm trying to think about his protagonists and his villains. And I don't, well, here's the thing. His dad is Stephen King. So his entire life has been swaddled by his father's words, his ideas. His very language that Joe Hill possesses was acquired through Stephen King. Mm -hmm. like, so if we see ideas, if we see words, phrases, characters that remind us of his dad, on some unconscious level, he'll always do that because yeah. that's literally how his brain was hotwired from the hands of Stephen King. With that being said, I I don't really see any connections. I don't, um, and maybe you should, maybe you'd have that breakthrough. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but no, I don't really see any like, oh my gosh, there's Bill Denbro. How could you make a stuttering character um, who's nicknamed Big Will? Right now, I, I don't really, yeah. <laughs> I don't really see that at all. And his villains are fine villains. I don't see any crossovers. Um, but again, Stephen King has written, what, 70 novels, thousands of shorts, hundreds of short stories. Yep. We're all going to cross those lines sometime. Absolutely. Good to know. Good to know. Um, I'm excited to read Joe Hill. Yeah, he's um, a fine author. But we're going to leave Sonny Boy and we're going back to Daddy. <laughs> Is there a story that we've not talked about that you love you hate something like that gets Stephen you passionate King is one that i hate but i've never read it fully so it seems unfair to say that you hate something you've never fully experienced so i'll leave that one alone i'm trying to think of ones that i truly detest with every fiber in my being and the great thing with king is i guess that doesn't really exist even a book night cujo that i might not never read um reread again I still found something to enjoy in it. Like in Cujo, yeah. I think it was wicked that he personified the dog so that we could see the dog's thoughts. And he does that with Oi in the Dark Tower series. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really cool style, stylistic um, stylistic tool for King to use. And I always appreciate that. Um, he was loaded off his mind, so he's doing crazy things. But still, <laughs> I think he executed that one fairly well with Cujo. Um, so there's not one that I hate. One that I love love, love, love that we haven't talked about is 112263. And we've, we we kind of talked about it with our last podcast, but if you haven't ever read it before, it's historical fiction. It's a sharp turn left from his usual um, monsters, right? There, there's really nothing. He tries to impart a little science fiction into it, but really the science fiction, you kind of forget about after reading because it's truly at its base, it's a love story. Um, and I can't think of a single other King story where I say, yeah, you know, at its base level, it's a love story. I can't think of anything else that comes close except it, maybe it. I think it is also a love story, loves uh, a story about desire and passion and, and memory, right? But yeah, 112263 is a great love story. Um, I'm only 28, but I know King readers, you know, vary from 12 to 98. And so I think yep. certainly for somebody who's older as well, 112263 would really kind of transport them back in time 
um, because King really was reliving his childhood. He'd relive in the 50s um, and the sights, sounds, and smells that made up the 50s. And he does it so well. Obviously, I was born in the 90s, not the 50s, but I feel like I know the 50s just a little bit more. Um, Agreed. So, yeah. Have you read it? Have you let, read 2263? I've not read 2263, but I, I got that feeling from it. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. you, you really like you're in this small town in Derry in what 1955 or something. Yeah. 58, I think 57. Yeah. 58. And yeah, he can really transport you and like you, you feel like you're there and it's really amazing, but eerie how just in you're there, you're in Derry. And that's something that he does so well is capturing the small town. What is a small town? Who makes it up? You know, and these it's the odd things that makes up a small town. And I think he does that so well at showcasing kind of the oddities um, of the everyday man. So yeah, mm-hmm. Derry is a great example of that. And, come, and, you know, I grew up in Massachusetts. I grew up in a small town. So when I read Stephen King, I'm like, this is it. Yeah, this is my town. That, that's my town. It's Not really... really. I don't know if it's a New England thing or what, but when you if you come from a small town, it's like Stephen King gets you. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, let me ask you your opinion on the it the new it movie. Have you seen it? Yes. Yeah, what's your what's your thought on that? I like the first movie. I thought it was fine. I didn't yeah, like how it was the word. I didn't like how it was just the kids. I think the whole back and forth between adults and kids is a very important part of the storytelling aspect yeah so when they ditched that i was like "Mm, okay not the best and they Um, try to bring her back in the first movie or the second movie excuse me the second movie i've gone on and on about it but no i'm gonna keep going on and on about it until they fix it. it 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 was cursed by being a summer blockbuster in my opinion Mm -hmm. it stopped being an it movie or a horror movie i should say and it became a comedy it became a thriller it yeah. became fun for the whole family it became a movie that you bring your day to and you're in high school my theater was packed with high schoolers i think i went on friday at a, like a seven o'clock showing so lesson yeah. learned on that one but like i remember there was one scene i, I can't remember what who it was but it was um I think there was like a head and the head started like spitting out black gunk and then they put it in slow-mo and they had like an 80s music so, um, music playing and I'm like, this is this Deadpool? Like, yeah, th- right. what, what are company? you trying to do? Yeah. And I thought in order to, you know, appease the masses, it lost its identity completely. And as great as the actor who played Pennywise right. was, and as much as I love him, he couldn't carry that crap movie. Well, they didn't give him any screen time either. Like he makes like 10 seconds of appearances within the first 90 minutes. It's, and that was my biggest qualm with it was I had high expectations that mm-hmm. we would get Pennywise's point of view because if, from the novel we get chapters told from pennywise and so it would make sense if we're doing this revolving point of view which it does we should see pennywise our main character and we we not only didn't get his point of view which is one thing but we didn't get any pennywise for pretty much the entirety of the movie and at least since, the first half yeah and since its release i keep hearing oh they want to do chapter three like the producer's interested the director's interested yeah, and like yeah the second one just ruined it so hard for me and yeah. um what really really surprised me was the adult cast was like they were all big name stars and i felt like half of them were phoning it in like bill um we know him from yeah, um McAvoy. from x-men he's professor x he does a great job i felt like he wasn't interested yeah, yeah, he's a terrific actor. He's in Split, which showcases every range he could possibly do. And you're right, he's not, he needs to be a star in that. And that was, yeah, another huge, huge red flag for me watching that movie was they made Bill Denbro a jerk. 
right? He was going to leave the restaurant right away. And that's not Big Bill. As an adult, Big Bill is resigned to the fact that war is coming. And that's why Pennywise doesn't visit him because that Mm -hmm. fear as an adult for Big Bill has evaporated and he's a hero. And that's why Big Bill, I know we haven't talked about it, but Big Bill is honestly number one for me in characters um, because he truly is a hero, right? He's compared to young John Kennedy at the beginning of the novel. And that's truly the character that he's demonstrated throughout the novel. Um, So to have the movie with them when we see them come together at the restaurant and Big Bill's the first one to leave in the parking lot, it's a slap in the face to everything that Big Bill Denbro is. Yeah. So yeah, that was, I think that's my second biggest qualm with that movie is you can't shift arguably one of the greatest King characters and mm-hmm. turn him into a dick. You can't, you just can't do that. Very, very sad. I, the movie had so much potential. I mean, God knows they had the budget. They had an amazing Pennywise and yeah. I didn't feel connected to these characters and people can say what they want about the nineties version with Tim Curry, but yeah, it may have some nineties cheesy moments, but I felt that was so true to the book. And I think it was maybe three hours, maybe a little bit longer. I don't know, but they packed in a lot of information from the book and told a more coherent story than either of the first um, two chapter one, chapter two did. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's too difficult of a story to ever put it on the big screen. Maybe it needs to be a mini series. That is my personal um, tinfoil hat theory. I think the, the streaming services were probably poking around at it. And I think Hollywood said, we need a, we need a big blockbuster. Yeah. Well, they got it. That's for certain. <sighs> And it was everywhere too. Like Pennywise was everywhere. Oh yeah, I was a teacher during that time, and all my students were Pennywise. They all yep. loved him. All of a sudden, everybody was reading it, which is awesome. As a teacher, when you see kids picking up a Stephen King book, there's not a greater feeling in the world. But yeah, they they had a lot of they had, they had a lot of momentum, and they veered it off the tracks. So disappointing. And on that depressing note, um. Thank you for that. Bring those horrible movies. I feel um, like almost everything I said today was very pessimistic, was very shunning. I love Stephen King and all of his predecessors. And I love, um, I love being able to analyze him. So um, at least we're given that right in this country. Analysts, like, you know, just because you give constructive criticism doesn't mean you're hating on him. I mean, no, not at all. You, you should be able to, you know, critique someone that you love. I mean, if anything, you know, that shows your love for this author. And, like, maybe you can work on female characters. Maybe you don't have to be so graphic in certain ways. Maybe you don't sell the it rights to Hollywood, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Josh, where can the good people find you? Right now you can find me on Instagram at Joshua Bates Author. Um, you can find anything from my past short story that has been published. That one's called Slither. Um, currently I'm working on a novel. I just finished my first novel called Sleep Tight, Don't Let the Death Bugs Bite. Um, and I'm currently working on my second novel about 50 pages in. Don't have a title for that one yet, but very exciting stuff. Yes, I actually transitioned this novel into first person, um, which I said earlier, I love that style of, um, point of view. So I'm, I'm, I'm loving this second novel so far. So thanks for asking. Um, I, I hope I can um, hope I can interact with anybody that wants to talk more King or anything else writing late related. Like I said, I'm a past teacher, so I kind of have my hands all throughout the English field. Definitely go check out Josh, check out um, his stories and yes, DM him, but also DM me, like talk to me about King. Like there's so much knowledge that we have knowledge that you have. Let's share this. Let's talk King. Josh, thank you so much for being on. Hopefully we can have you back next season for another King Month. And guys, um, please keep listening. Let us know in the comments what you thought. And until next time, have a good one, guys. Thanks.